Okay, it's 704. Good evening, everyone. My name is Lucy and I work at the Mississauga library and I'm your moderator this evening. If you're having any technical difficulties, please message me or my colleague Elizabeth in the chat box. Welcome to our virtual program lecture me. Tonight's program is how do children learn language with our presenter Elizabeth Johnson. We start with a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge the lands which constitute the present day city of Mississauga as being part of the treaty and traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron-Wendat and Wyandot Nations. We recognize these peoples and their ancestors as peoples who inhabited these lands since time immemorial. The city of Mississauga is home to many global indigenous peoples. As a municipality, the city of Mississauga is actively working towards reconciliation by confronting our past and our present, providing space for indigenous peoples within their territory to recognize and uphold their treaty rights and to support indigenous peoples. We formally recognize the Anishinaabe origins of our name and continue to make Mississauga a safe space for all mm -hmm. Indigenous peoples. And now a really quick overview of WebEx. On your screen, you'll see a chat box on the right hand side where the blue arrow is. You can select to message the host or panelists, share your questions and comments during the program using this feature. We invite you to put your questions in the chat box as they come up and they'll become part of the Q&A at the end of the presentation or possibly in the middle. We'll see. Also to let you know, closed captioning is enabled for this program. You can turn captioning on or off by clicking on the CC button on the bottom left hand corner indicated by the yellow rectangle. Once the captioning is turned on, you're also able to adjust the font size or change the background color from light to dark and by clicking on the three dots at the end of the black bar that will appear. The box in the middle with the green arrows is for reactions. You can let us know how you feel about what's being shared, so feel free to interact. Many of the 24-7 digital services offered by Mississauga Library are available for free with your library card. And they're also available from your home at mississaugalibrary.ca. We offer a large collection of ebooks and audiobooks through Libby by Overdrive and Hoopla. Hoopla also offers music, movies, TV shows, and comics. You can access digital magazines through Flipster and RB Digital for magazines. Press Reader has newspapers from all over the world in more than 60 languages. Free downloadable and streamable music is available through Freegal, and you can learn a huge number of languages on Mango languages. LinkedIn Learning offers opportunities to learn all kinds of new skills, everything from 3D animation to finance to writing skills. Visit our website or call us for details. Library newsletters are a nice way to find out what's happening at the library and other interesting news. Sign up for weekly newsletters so you can learn more about our upcoming programs and services. Now I'm going to pass the mic over to Rima Chakra from University of Toronto at Mississauga, who will introduce tonight's speaker. Thank you, Lucy. Hello, good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Rima Abushakra. I'm from the Experiential Education Unit, Office of the Vice Principal <coughs> Academic and Dean at the University of Toronto, Mississauga. In collaboration with the Mississauga Library System, welcome to our final lecture meet talk for the 2022-2023 season featuring Professor Elizabeth Johnson from the Department of Psychology. Dr. Johnson received her undergraduate degree from the University of Rochester, where she majored in brain and cognitive sciences and completed a Take 5 program in developmental biology and evolution. She, did, she then went on to earn her PhD in psychological and brain sciences at the Johns Hopkins University. During her final year, as a PhD student, Dr. Johnson spent two semesters at the speech group at I MIT. She then accepted a postdoctoral position at the Max Planck Institute for Psycholinguistics in the Netherlands. Dr. Johnson is now a Canada Research Chair in Spoken Language Acquisition and a professor at, at the Psychology Department at UTM. She is also the Director of University of Toronto Tri-Campus Graduate Program in Psychology. The main goal of her research program is to understand how young children acquire their native tongue. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Elizabeth Johnson. Over to you, Professor Johnson.
Thanks. Um, can everyone hear me? Yes, great. And you can see my slides? Yep, all good. Great. Um, so thank you for having me here today. Um, I, I have to thank the organizers organizers at the library, uh, Lucy and Elizabeth and, and the rest of the folks that were involved in inviting me. And I also have to thank the research office and the experiential learning unit at UTM. Um, and I also have to uh, thank uh, Arima for that really nice introduction. Um, I am thrilled to be talking to you tonight about, um, yeah, how children learn language. So just to start off our discussion tonight, uh, I know I can't hear your answers, but I just want to ask you all to think back to the last time you learned a new language. I'm not talking about maybe taking a course, you know, a single course in a language that you, you know, studied for, for three or four months and then didn't do much more with. But the last time you were really fully immersed and had to learn to use a language to communicate, to get by in your day to day life. Um, so how was it? If you think about it, I'm guessing that your answer is going to depend a lot on when you learn that language. So for some of you, the last time you learned a new language um, would be when you were an infant. So maybe you don't remember learning that language. Uh, but as we're going to discuss in, in today's um, talk, you, you probably had a fairly easy time learning uh, your first language if you learned it or your, the last language you learned if you did it as an infant. Um, infants just seem to be set up to learn language. If you learned your last language when you were, I don't know, eight, nine years of age, maybe a tween, you know, chances are you you remember. You remember learning that language. Maybe you remember um, some good things, some bad things. I bet you remember some struggles, maybe some potentially stressful situations where you were trying to remember a verb conjugation or whether a noun was masculine or feminine or um, just how to pronounce a particular word. Um, but chances are it was a bit of a challenge and you had to work at it, but you mastered the language because children are also pretty darn good language learners. But if the last time you learned a new language um, was in adulthood, um, well, learning a new language in adulthood can be a challenge. Uh, it differs. Some people find it a lot easier than others. But generally speaking, it's much more difficult to learn a new language when you're an adult or over the age of 17, let's define adult here, um, than if you are a, a baby or, or a, a young child. Um, so why is this? Um, why, why, why would it be so much harder to learn a language when you're an adult than it is when you're a child or, or a baby? Um, well, this is, this is something that I started thinking about when I was an undergraduate. Um, I mean, I now, my official title, I'm a developmental psycholinguist. I can tell you, I did not know what a developmental psycholinguist was before I went to university. Um, it's something that I really became interested in when I was an undergraduate, uh, thanks to a professor that I had, Alyssa Newport, who was responsible um, for putting together this, this now famous figure that suggests that um, when you learn a language has a huge effect on, on how well you will learn that language. We all know this just from day-to-day -day life, but there was actual um, evidence looking at immigrants to the US, folks who immigrated at different ages and how, well, they mastered the grammar of, of the language. And there have been so many other studies on this topic. And again and again and again, we see this pattern where infants, kids, they're really good at learning a language. Adults, not so hot. Huge variability. I mean, some adults are better than others. Um, and some kids struggle more than others. But for the most part, this pattern really holds up. And this is this is something I I found really fascinating. So infants they can learn a language very well. Uh, young kids struggle a bit. As you can see, performance is dropping off. The way you read this figure is you, basically, if you wanna see how well you might be predicted to learn a new language, you find your age on the horizontal axis and you find um, <laughs> how high the dots are on the, the vertical axis. And, and you can see where you would be. I'm, I'm over there. 
um, you know, in the adult range. Uh, so yeah, for me, it would be very difficult to learn a new language. And for most of us um, as adults, it's, it's difficult. Why is it that young children, they struggle to do so many things. Adults are better than young children in so many things. So kids struggle to learn to ride a bike. They struggle, you know, to wait their turn, right? They, they struggle to, they struggle to tie their shoes. These are all things that um, we generally find easier uh, to do as adults. Um, you know, we can do complex problem solving, we can do algebra, but when it comes to learning a new language, kids outperform us. So why are they so good at learning languages? This is a question that I found so interesting as an undergraduate taking neuroscience classes and linguistics classes and drawing sort all sorts of uh, links between how the brain was developing and what people could learn at different ages is a question that that really drew me into the field i found it um, fascinating and it's what made me decide to become a language researcher um so as a language researcher what do i do i i think that it'd be good to just just to be clear about what i do there are lots of things i could do saying i'm a language researcher um, saying that I'm a developmental psycholinguist, that could mean a lot of different things. People who go by those labels, um, they work on really different topics. So, for example, there could be a, a theoretical approach um, where, oh, hold on, I'm getting a pop-up, sorry, go away. Okay, I think I got rid of it. Sorry about that. Um, so there could be more theoretical questions like, is human language what makes human excel at abstract thinking and problem solving in a way that other animal species um, do not? So is, is human language um, what makes us special in a lot of ways? Um, or you could ask sort of a more engineering question. Do infants learn language just by tracking sort of raw statistics? Are they these raw, very powerful computing machines? And if so, can we create an artificial intelligence that can mimic human language learning? We just have to have a powerful enough computer who can track all the different possible statistics. Um, or you could ask more of a, a health-related question, for example. So why do some kids struggle with language learning and others don't? So how can we help children who are struggling? Or maybe more of an educational question, like are we doing French immersion right? Um, you know, certainly our, our country uh, has, has invested a lot in, in having French uh, instruction available and English instruction available to, to all children. Are, are we doing those immersion programs right or could we be doing them better? Um, and then there, there are policy questions. So, for example, what could we do to support revitalization of endangered indigenous languages? These are all the sorts of questions that someone who calls themselves a developmental psycholinguist or a language scientist might really focus their work on. But what I focus my work on is um, it's, it's actually pretty general and pretty basic. And you might wonder why I chose this in particular, but my area of expertise is spoken language acquisition in, in neurotypical infants and, and toddlers. Um, and, you know, I, my, my research is not aimed at creating interventions, for example, to, to help children that are struggling with language. It's not designed to come up with practical solutions for the types of um, issues that I mentioned in my previous slide. Um, I'm not an engineer. I'm not trying to recreate learning in a machine, but I, I really like the area of research that I'm in because if you think about it, um, well, let me just tell you, we don't know how infants and toddlers, I'll, I'll tell you the punchline here, we, we don't actually know how children learn language. Um, we, we've learned a lot about how they do it, but I can't, like, I, I can't tell you exactly how they do it. And we have so much to learn that I really like doing um, research on this question because my results and my findings, um, all the work that my students and I do in my lab, this can help us address those other issues that I mentioned. Um, so I, I uh, just wanted to be really clear about what it is that I do um, and why I think it's important um, and how it relates to many other questions that you might have about language learning. Okay, so before I go any further, I thought I would just orient you a bit uh, in terms of what I'd like to do. I, I only have like 40 minutes, so I, I can't go too much into depth on any of these topics I'm gonna mention, but I just kind of wanna give you a sampler platter of, of what it is that we know about language acquisition in young infants and toddlers. Um, so I'm gonna start off with some questions. 
I'm going to go over when and how children first learn language, just give you sort of an overview of what we know there. Uh, what do children learn when they learn a new language? That's a really important question. Um, and that's a question that um, it's, it's funny when you're a researcher and you have students coming into your lab, sometimes they interest you in questions that you didn't even realize were interesting, but they, they teach you that they're interesting questions. That's a sign of a really good student. So I have some great students in my lab and they've drawn me into all these questions about what exactly children are learning when they learn a language. And you'll um, see more about that when I talk about that, that question. Um, another uh, big question is how does multilingualism affect language development? Um, and that's a really important question in the GTA, right? Um, I have to be honest, I am so lucky to have ended up in the GTA as a language researcher. I don't, I can't imagine a better place to be doing language research because we have one of the most linguistically diverse populations in the world here. Um, and it's, it's just a fantastic place to have landed. Uh, and to have been able to set up, uh, well, I have a baby lab. I study how babies and infants learn language. It's great that I, I am located here. So I'll talk a bit about multilingualism. And and finally, um, I, can, I can address the question of what can we do to support language development? Um, I think that a lot of, uh, a lot of parents, um, you know, wonder uh, what what is the the best way to to help children master language um, quickly and and as well as they can? I also want to go over some myths, and there might be a lot more myths I didn't think of. Um, so I'm hoping you guys can help me when we get to the uh, question period, and you can tell me maybe some myths you've heard of, and and we can chat about them. Um, and then finally, I want to you know just wrap up and summarize, and also. Really, really importantly, I want to tell you how to get involved in, in research. So if you're in the GTA community um, and you have children and you would like to participate, I'm going to tell you all about how you can participate. Uh, we've got a fantastic, if you've never been to the UTM campus, UTM campus is, it's a, it's, it's a gorgeous campus. It's getting nicer every day. And um, I'm, I'm very proud of, of the setup that we have there. And we really have world-class researchers at, at UTM. Our developmental researchers uh, are, are amazing. Um, and it's, it's really fun to come in. So I'm gonna tell you all about how to get involved. And if you don't have children, um, you know, there may be other ways to get involved. So for example, uh, we're oftentimes looking for adults who learned English late in life. Um, for example, right now, we're really looking for people who are um, native Mandarin speakers, but learned English late in life. So I'm going to tell you all about uh, how you can get involved. And getting involved is fun because then you actually learn more about language and you get to talk to the students who are, who are getting PhDs in language acquisition, which can be a lot of fun if you're interested in the topic. Okay, so let's start off with these questions. And um, the first question on my list here is when and how did children first learn language? So when did ch children first learn language? I mean, the answer to this question, it, it depends on how you define language learning. So I think most language scientists, at least language scientists that I hang out with, those who tend to do experimental work uh, with young infants and, and toddlers and, and younger children, um, we would say that language learning gets started while the child or the fetus is still in the womb. Um, and it's not because, you know, moms or moms to be have to walk around with headphones on their belly like this picture seems to suggest. Although I have to admit when when I got pregnant with my own kids, I had so many people give me um, little belts to wear on my belly to introduce sounds, but I, I didn't use them because you don't actually need that for a fetus to be exposed to language. So um, the auditory system of a fetus becomes operational in the third trimester. And the most salient external stimulation, auditory stimulation that the fetus receives is the mom's voice. Um, and we know this because, you know, you can see the fetus responding to the mother's voice through motor activity, uh, visually through ultrasound, you can see uh, reactions. Um, and also if you test newborn babies, they recognize their mother's voice. They also recognize their, their mother's language. Interestingly enough, Interestingly enough, um, it's actually the mother's voice which is most salient to the, the fetus. So other caregivers, for example, fathers, um, they may have spoken just as much as the mother uh, in the, the presence, well, 
they couldn't have spoken as much as the mother unless they were together nonstop. So I guess that wouldn't have happened. They could have spoken quite a bit in the fetus's presence, um, but that voice probably won't be recognized by the fetus because um, the voices that are not the mother's are not as loud to the to the fetus. I can go into more uh, detail if you'd like, but. And then the next probably um, well-known thing is that when do children start speaking? Around the first birthday, you typically get first words. Um, I say this with some trepidation because uh, I think people uh, sometimes get a little um, too focused on on milestones. So if I say children typically spend or say their first word around their first birthday, and your child doesn't happen to say their first word by their first birthday, don't panic. There's huge individual variation. So I have two kids, and one said their first word well before their first birthday. It happened to be the name of our family dog. It was not mom. It was it was our family dog's name. Um, and you know the other child said their first word well after, <laughs> well after their first birthday. But both um, acquired language um, very well, and and are very verbally skilled and healthy children. So don't don't worry if, if your child doesn't speak their first word immediately um, when they turn one. There's a lot of variation. That said, went on a tangent a bit there, but that said, from being born to reaching their first birthday, uh, I've, I've given you two sort of points in, in development of language, but a lot must happen between birth and and saying your first word, right? I mean, how could you possibly say your first word without learning a lot? So in fact, um, we've we've learned in recent years, this is this is something that I'm really interested in. So my research is very, very focused on um, development between four months and about 10 months. I find that to be a really, really interesting age. Um, and what we've learned through uh, different types of studies is that kids learn so much before they say that first word. If you think about all of the knowledge that needs to be acquired, um, one interesting way we've learned about um, we've learned about children's language knowledge early on is through studies that um, test adults' language abilities actually uh, on languages that they were exposed to or learned as infants, but then never had exposure to again. So for example, um, um, a uh, very well-known study has looked at um, Korean children who were adopted in the Netherlands. And those children who were adopted between three and seven months of age, um, all of the children in the study hadn't had any contact with Korean since they were adopted, the Korean language. Um, and they had learned Dutch. Dutch had basically replaced Korean as their first language or their their only language. And they couldn't even identify Korean. For example, if you if you played three languages and Korean was one of them, they couldn't even reliably identify which language was Korean. So they really forgot Korean. And yet those children could relearn Korean sounds and words faster than um, people who had never been exposed to Korean as as babies. So that we know really early on, um, information is being laid down about the sound structure of a, of a language. So really, in a way, uh, even if you don't remember your first language, this is, this is actually a much more common situation than people realize the language that you learn first is not necessarily the language that you know now. Um, there's still some residue left over. So it's, it's very interesting. We know that a lot is learned between three and seven months. We also know from experimental studies, like the work that I do in my lab, um, that kids learn about language really quickly. So by, uh, this is one of the first studies I did as a PhD student, by five months, kids can actually recognize their, um, they can tell apart accents. They can recognize the accent um, that they typically hear. So American English learning infants can tell apart American English and British English, for example. Um, and, you know, you really need to know quite a bit to tell apart those two varieties of, of English. Uh, and children also start to begin to understand words. So um, my PhD supervisor, uh, one of his, his big splashy findings was that this was many, many years ago, many, many years ago, a couple of decades ago, um, that children could, for example, understand the words mom and dad by five to six months of age. So if you show them a picture of their mom and a picture of their dad, and you use the label that their family uses to refer to mom and dad, whatever that may be, mama, mom, daddy, dad, papa, um, 
those six month old infants, five to six month old infants will look at the mom more when they hear mom and the dad more when they hear dad. Um, and follow up work more recently has shown that kids at this age also show recognition and comprehension, or at least comprehension maybe is a bit much, but a mapping sort of between objects in the world and the sounds um, for things like shoe or uh, dog, all sorts of words. And what we've been trying to do in, in my lab, I'm trying to interview you now in case you happen to have a six month old or a nine month old or a young child at home. Uh, we're trying to look at whether or not kids have um, categorical knowledge at this age too. So for example, do children know that um, the four-legged furry things are dogs and their particular dog is named Fido and Fido can be called dog or Fido. Uh, so those are some of the questions um, that we're asking now. But the, the long and the short of it is that by, by six months, you wouldn't think that an infant is really um, comprehending much, but um, evidence suggests using eye tracking studies like you see here pictured on the left, um, that, that infants really do learn quite quickly, long before they're talking. They're understanding much more than you would think. Um, so how do infants do this? I'm telling you all these incredible things that infants can learn to do really, really early on, but how? I haven't told you how. I'm telling you a lot of when, but how about the how? Um, and why do they outperform us when it comes to learning language? Well, I, I have to confess, like I said, we can't fully answer that question. This is something that's being actively researched, but we do think it's it's differences in um, the brains of infants and children and adults work, and it's differences in um, the information that uh, people attend to at different ages. And and how how in general do we think infants are learning language? Well, what what we've learned um, and what a lot of work that my students and I have, have done uh, has, has reinforced is that children are incredibly good pattern detectors. They're really good at picking up statistical patterns, but they're not just pattern detectors. They're not just uh, like if you were to create a computer to detect all the possible patterns that are in the auditory input that a child gets. Um, that's that's not what they do. They're very biased learners. So they they pick up statistical patterns, but they're biased about which patterns they track. So they can take shortcuts and they can learn um, much faster than you would expect. And we're still trying to understand what sort of biases children have in the patterns that they pull out and what sort of information they're most attuned to and which which patterns they learn most easily. So Hey, if you want to help me, help us, my whole lab understand this as well as the entire field. Um, I'm not the only language lab in in the GTA. You can come into my lab and help us out if you if you have children, um, or even if you're an adult. Uh, we do have adult studies too. There are also um, actually so many developmental labs in Toronto. Lots of opportunities to help us understand this. So get involved. So I've talked about when and how. Now I want to talk about what children learn, and this is this is going to be shifting gears a bit. So this is talking about a topic that, um, you know, me in my traditional training, I, I wasn't initially really drawn to this question I'm going to talk about now, but I, I have become increasingly interested in it. So you think of language learning as involving learning words, learning vocabulary, learning grammar, right? That's what language is. But language is a lot more than that. It's is really tied up with social knowledge too. It's it's all about communication and communication is social. So language conveys emotion and attitude. And when adults, for example, imitate others, it can also be used to convey liking. Uh, so if I imitate your pronunciation or if I imitate the words you use, I might be trying to align with you, for example, to show you that I, I want to sort of, um, I, I, I approve of you, I wanna be, uh, uh, closer to you somehow, or you can also use it to sort of pull distance apart. Um, also, um, adults use language to infer social status and whether others are in group or out group members, for example. And this, you know, it's good and it's bad. So language can pull people together. It can give you a sense of identity, shared identity, right? Um, language can be a really wonderful thing to pull people together. Um, but it can also 
have a negative side uh, where people can be um, excluded, for example, because maybe they speak if not a different language, maybe they speak with a different um, accent, for example. Um, so the kids, you know, as they're acquiring language, when do they acquire this side of language? How does the social side all fit into the picture? Well, we know that children understand the emotional side of speech early in development. Now, uh, more classic work seemed to suggest that kids struggled with the emotion and speech a lot, but more recent work um, in my lab as well as others has suggested actually they get it a lot more than we thought. We just weren't asking the question in the right way. Um, and kids also begin expressing their identity through their speaking style quite early too. Um, so for example, um, a lot of labs have looked at this and, and an example from my lab would be looking at how kids will um, change the words that they're using when they're speaking um, or change the way they're pronouncing words depending on who they're they're interacting with um, to sort of establish uh, rapport for example but here's a question do children also use language to identify who oh sorry there's a typo there who belongs and who does not so do they use it to classify people as like me or not like me like um, this is person belong to my group or does this person not belong to my group? So again, this is this thing in adults that is both good and bad. So it's good because you can immediately feel um, a connection with someone who speaks language the way you do. And it can also be not so good in the sense that this information, for example, you speak differently than I do. You use different vocabulary items. You have a different accent. You sound different. This can also be a way to separate yourself from others or to exclude people because they don't um, belong. So there's actually a literature on this um, coming mostly out of the U.S. Plus a few studies from from Paris. There, there's there's been a, a literature that's been established, and. The results are really depressing in a way. So using this paradigm that um, I find I, I don't really like too much, it's, it's, it, it's sad, but in this paradigm, you can um, present children with uh, faces of, of peers, their age match peers, they're just faces. And then you play um, recordings that are supposedly recordings of those children speaking um, and you can do a study, for example, where the only difference between two children is uh, whether they speak in the socially dominant uh, accent or whether they speak with a foreign accent, for example. Um, and American kids that have been tested show a whopping preference for kids that talk like them, kids who speak language as a, um, a native language, for example as opposed to having maybe a French accent or a Spanish accent or some other accent. Um, when I read about this literature and my students read about this literature, we all felt that kids in the GTA couldn't possibly feel this way about accents. We thought, no, nah, not here in, in the GTA, not where we have so many different languages. So we actually, um, we, we've been looking at linguistic biases in young kids and when kids pick up on this information and how they use it. And um, the, the results have been disheartening, to be honest. So in actuality, um, kids here in the GTA, as young as three, four years of age, do show a strong preference for peers who speak like them in these sort of artificial paradigms. But nonetheless, they do show these preferences. Uh, for children who sound like they grew up in the GTA learning English, the, the socially dominant sort of English um, version of English here, not people who sound like they learned another language first and then learned English. So the worst part of it is that these biases seem to get stronger with age. So we've tested kids all the way up to nine and the the biases and the preferences for people who speak with a native Ontario accent grow stronger and stronger and we've tested it in different contexts so we've tested it for example like who do you think would be a better teacher and they hear adults with different accents and we see it there too so here again i'm asking you to help me i actually have students working on strategies for how we could mitigate um, those biases and you know um, it would be great to have more help in, in developing um, some strategies for, for mitigating these biases. And it's a question I really wanna um, explore more and understand better. Okay, so next I wanna talk about how multilingualism affects language development. Um, 
me see. So the advice that my parents received, I know I'm kind of old now, so um, this was a long time ago, and I grew up in the U.S., so things uh, may have been different in the U.S., but the advice that my parents received um, when I was a baby and I had two parents who spoke different languages as their first language, the advice was just speak English to your kid. Um, you don't want to slow language development. Um, if you want your child to be, uh, uh, to learn English, uh, you know, properly, just, just speak English. And um, unfortunately, my parents listened. And I still, I still am very sad about this, um, that that was the advice of the day and that my parents actually listened because I'm a hopeless monolingual. Here I am someone, I study language acquisition and I only speak one language fluently. I have made attempts to learn other languages. I have attempted to learn Italian. I have attempted to learn French. I have even attempted to learn sign language and they were all really, you know, I, I can, I can do book learning of these languages, but in terms of actually being able to communicate, hmm, not so good. So it's it's very sad, and I know a lot of people are in my situation. So why? Why on earth would people tell parents to only speak one language to their child? Well, I think there were a lot of misunderstandings about what kids could do. Kids are, are, are built to learn more than one language. Um, the, ball, the, the majority of the world uh, people speak more than one language, right? It's unusual to be a monolingual. So I think some of the um, reasons people advised against speaking more than one language is because first they thought infants wouldn't be able to tell apart languages. But, you know, I've already told you something that, that debunks that, you know, five-month-olds can tell apart not only languages, but accents. And in fact, newborn babies born to moms who spoke more than one language can tell apart the two languages that their mom spoke when they were still in the womb. Um, there's also claims that bilinguals show slower, uh, sorry, not lower, slower vocabulary development. Well, you know, they might show slower vocabulary development if you just look at their English vocabulary, but if you look at their vocabulary and all the different languages they're learning, they're usually the same size vocabulary as a monolingual child, if not a larger vocabulary, often a larger vocabulary if you add together the words they know in all their different languages. And another thing that I think used to confuse people is that children would mix languages. So they might say a sentence with vocabulary items from the two languages that they were learning and people thought they were confused. But if you think about it, if you happen to be a bilingual, code switching is really common. If you, if you, um, if your goal is to communicate, sometimes it's actually adaptive to mix your languages, especially if you know the people you're talking to understand both of those languages. So, um, I would say that the benefits of speaking more than one language to your child are whoppingly big. So go back to this figure that I showed you earlier. Um, certainly learning a language early on is a lot uh, easier than learning it later on. And especially if this is going to allow you to communicate with caregivers or family members uh, or community members in a language that's their first language. Of course, it's different to be able to communicate to, for example, your grandmother in the language that is her, her first language, or maybe her only language. Um, that's just very, very valuable. And also it, it, uh, it can be very, uh, useful to, um, know more than one language and, and sort of understand how languages differ. That really just gives you a whole new perspective on the world. So my advice is, uh, go for it. Bilingualism, monolingual, monolingualism is, is odd. Uh, multilingualism, not just bilingualism, but multilingualism is, is great. Um, and even if English becomes the dominant language when school starts for a child, I don't think um, that doesn't mean that that other language or other languages that may have been learned before, in, before school starts, that they're lost, right? Remember what I told you, um, you know, even someone who completely forgets that language they learned as a child can't even recognize it. There, There is still some residual trace of that original language. And if if um, there's a desire to relearn the language in adulthood, it's easier if you've been exposed as a child or as a baby. So yeah, exposure to multiple languages is great, um, in my opinion. So what can we do to support language development, whether it be monolingual language de development, multilingual language development, um, as parents, as caregivers, as teachers, what can we do? Well. I mean, a lot of this advice you've heard, interact with your child. You can gesture and talk and have conversations, even if the kids are too young to respond to you. That 
turn-taking conversation that you can have with a with a, um, a young infant is actually very useful and it, it establishes all sorts of important um, information for the child. So definitely um, those, those interactions are great. Uh, enjoy reading time and maybe even check out library story time once in a while for a change of pace. Um, you know, this is a great opportunity. We know kids expand their vocabulary. Uh, by by reading books, the repetitions, the rhymes, it's all really, really beneficial. Even when you have a young child that can't understand um, the book, it's, it's really great to be um, reading to them regularly from an early age. Um, and we know that greater reading times are associated with, um, you know, faster development of language skills. Um, if you're raising your child bilingually or multilingually, um, be sure that the child gets plenty of exposure to the both languages or all the languages, if possible, the languages they're trying to learn, um, and that they have reason to communicate in them. One thing you do not necessarily need to do, um, so I know that uh, it used to be strongly advised that parents who wanted to raise multilingual kids, bilingual kids, um, should do OPAL, so one person, one language. So for example, the mom, would only speak language A, the dad would only speak language B. Even if both parents spoke both languages, you just stick to that because then you you um, you avoid the situation. I think this was partially motivated by a fear that kids would confuse languages, and we're just not worried about that anymore. So if you want to stick to one person, one language, you can. And if that works for you, go for it, because what it does do is it ensures that children get input in both languages. but. I think that sometimes parents can feel or families can feel that this is, it's difficult, right? Because to always speak, maybe maybe you're the one that's assigned to speak the language that's not your first language, for example. Um, that can be really uh, difficult. And, and we don't naturally not speak both languages. So uh, you, you don't have to feel like you need to do it. The important thing is that a child gets exposure um, in lots of different circumstances, if possible, and has motivation to learn the different languages. But you don't necessarily have to stick to OPAL, one person, one language. Again, if it's working for you, go for it. But if it's um, difficult and feels artificial, you don't have to feel bound to that. Um, and if you're worried, talk to an expert. Uh, I actually took this from the Peel Region School site. I'm just flashing it up quickly. There are lots of great resources in the GTA if, if you are worried that your child isn't reaching um, the milestones that you think they should. Okay, so now I've gone over these questions just to give you a feel for sort of the state of the art in um, language research. Uh, and now I thought I could just debunk a couple of myths. Um, quickly. And actually, before I do that, I realized um, I didn't make a slide for this, but I realized I did promise in my abstract that I would talk a bit about how the pandemic affected language development in children. Um, and I just wanted to say that there is not a lot of work looking at, for example, vocabulary development um, or um, speaking uh, development in infants and toddlers. Um, there, there are some studies and one of those studies, actually, we did a large scale study. One of my PhD students did a large scale study in our lab. Um, we had over, oh gosh, over 3,000, 4,000 kids participate in that study. And um, I can say more later, but I'd say in general, the news is good. So for most of the children um, that we looked at, we don't see a really big negative impact on um, on their vocabulary development, for example, because of the pandemic. So if we compare vocabulary growth before the pandemic hit and in those children um, who were uh, most, most affected by lockdowns, so we look at uh, those children um, and their vocabulary development between like six and 18 months, um, I'll just say that the, the effect was not, um, generally speaking, children failed, fared very, very well. They were quite resilient. There were some children um, that that may have had a slight negative impact, um, but that was um, just a select sample of those kids. So I can talk about that more if you want. But in general, I think the news is good. I think kids are resilient and they're they're doing okay. Okay, moving on to myths. So myth number one: um, learning more than one language at once will negatively negatively impact your child's development. Well, 
No, I, I, I would say that for most children, um, you know, again, every situation is different. So if you're worried, talk to a professional. But for most children, um, learning more than one language at once um, won't negatively impact your child. If you are worried about, for example, the fact that they may start speaking a little later than other children who are not learning the same number of languages, maybe they're only learning one language, you know, that's to be expected. Um, and um, yeah, in, in general, uh, you don't have to worry about um, exposure to more than one language at once. Children are built to handle more than one language at once. It's really more the norm uh, in if we look at across the world's population. So no, don't worry about it. Myth number two, speaking to your baby like they are a baby will slow language development. Um, this seems to be a big one. So oh, this is going to be really embarrassing. Um, and I can't do it all. It's going gonna, it's gonna to sound bizarre because it's hard to do when I'm staring at a screen, but I'll look at the baby in the picture and try to do it. But you know that sing-songy voice you do when you talk to a baby. Oh, isn't that sweet? Yeah, that, that voice. Um, you know what I mean. So some people worry that speaking to a child like that will hinder um, uh, development. And there's really... Um, no evidence that 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 is the case. So um, you, you don't want to talk to a six year old like that. But uh, speaking to infants um, and to some extent toddlers like that is generally not an issue. Um, and the interesting thing is that research suggests that we actually adapt uh, the information we're providing um, through that sort of infant directed speech. So when we really need that that attention getting mechanism, we really were we're we're emphasizing anything that will get a baby's attention in our speech. And when we need to highlight certain words, we we position things in, in salient positions and use our voice and the melody of our voice to really accentuate information that kids need to get. So I think you don't have to be too worried about that um, infant directed speech. Um, and in fact, some people uh, actually, many labs, um, although I find the evidence a little controversial, but I mean, a lot of people would claim that um, that infant directed style of speech really scaffolds language development and can actually uh, speed language acquisition. So um, I, I don't think you have to be as worried about that, that speaking style. You do not have to speak to your child as if they are an adult. It is OK to use that sort of emotionally um, charged happy tone that that children just love uh, myth number three you should always correct toddlers when they do not pronounce words properly um so i think this uh i'll give an example from one of my own kids who used to call sharks socks and that could be very confusing she just she couldn't say sharks she said socks and we learned that socks meant sharks and gosh if she was actually trying to say socks hopefully we didn't think she was saying sharks but um the thing is that we've learned through, uh, if, if I had corrected her, she would have gotten quite annoyed with me. I would say, you mean shark? She'd be like, sock. I'm like, yeah, you mean shark? She's like, yeah, I said sock. Uh, so, so when children say things, toddlers um, say things a little differently than we expect, and we, we might call that a, a mispronunciation. Um, what we've shown with perceptual studies is that toddlers typically have very good representations of words. They actually understand words spoken by adults better than their own pronunciation of words. And we know this because we actually recorded two-year-olds saying uh, labeling objects. Um, and we recorded their parents labeling objects and they actually understand their parents or even a strange adult better than they understand their own voice. So what we think is going on is that they actually, um, they know how to say the word, uh, but when they say it, um, due to limitations in, in production, et cetera. It doesn't come out um, the way that, for example, you might expect it to be pronounced, but um, correcting them will f oftentimes frustrate them. I'm not saying you should never correct a child, but I think that you shouldn't feel the need to um, repeatedly correct a, a toddler. Um, usually those those pronunciations just develop with with time. Myth number four, young children can expand their vocabularies and learn new languages by watching videos. So I know this is a controversial one. Um, I know that, you know, screens are ubiqu ubiquitous. Um, but what I am saying here is that um, 
infants and toddlers don't really learn language from uh, passive videos. Um, and in fact, it's not recommended by pediatricians that children under two have screen time. Uh, I'm not saying that screen time, um, certain types of screen time can't be beneficial for older kids. So for example, four and five year olds can really benefit from certain types of programming. Uh, but infants and toddlers really don't. So there's a fair bit of experimental evidence that they really just don't learn from, from videos. Um, but I am not saying that, for example, Skyping with uh, relatives is, is a bad thing. I'm talking about passive exposure. Um, passive exposure to um, to another language or to, to a language uh, tape that might be um, might be suggesting that they are teaching new vocabulary items to your kids. Really, honestly, take your kids to, to story time at the library. That, that would be a, a better way to build vocabulary than to buy language tapes that, that are supposedly teaching them new vocabulary items. So um, pediatricians really don't recommend screen times for kids under two. Infants and toddlers aren't gonna learn language from um, screens. I'm not saying that older children can't benefit. Um, so. Uh, for example, my own kids, you know, in French immersion, I would encourage them to watch uh, cartoons in, in French. They're older, they can actually gain vocabulary items from that, but infants and toddlers don't learn language from, uh, from recordings. Okay, so what's my summary here? Um, language acquisition starts early, really early. Um, you know, you may have heard kids can hear things in the womb, but kids are actually starting to show recognition of words at six months. That's amazing to me. Um, and first languages are never really fully lost, which is also really amazing. There's something special about those first three to seven months of life. Things that are heard then really do make this permanent imprint on the, on the brain. Um, in addition to rules and vocabulary, language learning also involves social factors like knowing how to adapt your speaking style to different contexts and for better or worse, unfortunately, two times, sometimes worse as, as the examples I gave, internalizing some culture specific heuristics about how different people speak. Um, and multilingualism is the norm across the world's population. So don't fear speaking more than one language to your child. Um, I, I wish I could get in a time machine and go back and tell my own parents to please, please not just speak English to me. That would be great. And finally, rich in-person multimodal interactions are best to support language and, and reading is also great. Okay, so do you want to learn more? Um, if you think these questions are interesting or if you're like, gosh, we still have a lot to learn. It's true, we still have a lot to learn. If you wanna help us, or help other researchers in the GTA, um, you can scan this, this code to uh, be taken to a registration page to learn more about research opportunities um, in, in Mississauga. Uh, you could, if you wanna learn about my lab in particular, if you're me and you always wanna know more before you sign up to do things, um, you can go to my lab webpage, www.classlab.psycholinguistics.ca. Class stands for Child Language and Speech Studies Lab. Um, and you click on, I've highlighted it in yellow there because I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, uh, for parents. If you click on the for parents link, it'll take you to this page. And this page, if you go to that big red button on the bottom left, or uh, this blue button actually in the, the middle left, um, you can learn more about um, opportunities to participate in studies in the lab. Um, or uh, you could always just give our lab a call or you could email us if you have questions. Um, we'd be happy to hear from you. Um, and um, I also just wanted to say that lab visits are easy, fun, and educational. Um, so we schedule at your convenience. Um, we are open. Um, we are open weekdays, weekends, early morning. We work around parents' schedules. Um, we have both online and in-person studies. Um, we, we didn't have online studies before the pandemic, but we learned that we can do things that we couldn't imagine during the pandemic. So now we actually have both online and in-person studies and our in-person testing is really just ramping up up again. So please come visit us. It's a lot of fun. Again, we have we have great space um, on the UTM campus and UTM is a great campus to come see if you haven't seen it lately. It's changed. Um, we have free supervision for accompanying siblings. Uh, so if you've got three kids and only one is coming to participate in a study, um, we've got lots of people on hand to uh, to stay in the big waiting room full of toys and, and entertain your other kids. 
Uh, we have free reserve parking in an underground parking garage. It's really easy. You drive onto com campus. There are little signs that say infant and child studies. You can file, follow them. You can park underground. So in the winter, you don't even have to wear a coat necessarily. You just take the elevator right up to our lab. It's very easy to get there. Um, we give everyone a small thank you gift and a lab newsletter. The thank you gift is if you choose, it can be a t-shirt, a junior scientist t-shirt and a, a little um, junior scientist diploma. diploma. Um, we also have uh, board books that we give out and other types of toys for, for older children. Um, we have lab newsletters we send out once a year that summarize our results. Um, and finally, I mean, you get a chance to chat with my awesome uh, students who are all studying language acquisition. Um, so it can be fun to visit. And we're also happy to come out to you. So here's a photo. <laughs> I guess it's now getting a little old. This was uh, prior to the pandemic. We did Science Rendezvous at the library. Um, we've done lots of events in the community. We've done the Bread and Honey Festival. We've done the Japanese Festival. We've done, um, you know, sometimes we go to the farmer's market. Sometimes we do, um, yeah, lots of things. So. Uh, if you see us in the community, come talk to us, or if there's something that we've, we've gone to library story times, actually, if there's something, um, some audience you think would like to hear our message, let us know. Uh, there are, again, lots of students who are probably more engaging speakers than I am. So please let us know. And, um, yeah, thank you for your time and I welcome your questions. That was very engaging. <laughs> Um, there is a testimonial in the chat about your studies and participation in the studies. A mother, oh, says, wow. a mother says it was a great experience and her daughter was treated with so much respect and care by the researchers. Um, yeah, that makes me happy. Thank you. Yeah, it's wonderful to think of these little babies as these most amazing learning machines and these, these people who are studying them with such awe and care and respect. Um, I have the best, I have the, I have the best, I have the best job in the world. I get to like, you know, I, I get to, to hang out with, with kids and do science. I mean, what could be better? I kind of think you might have the best job. Yeah. Um, yeah. there are other questions though, but we're going to go through them. There's a question from a mother of a nine-year-old and she says, if her child is not interested in learning our language, so I assume that's like a first language. Is it yeah. bad if I sign them up for an international language learning? So mm, what do you mean by, so I'm not sure if I understand what international language learning is, sorry. Yeah, if we can get Anne to actually speak, um, Elizabeth, can you? What, what do, how do I do that? Oh, uh, you're talking to the other yeah, Elizabeth. Our, yeah. <laughs> Library um, Elizabeth, if we could get her to actually speak. Yep, I'll send Anne a request to unmute. So, okay. um, Anne, if you're comfortable asking your question out loud, you should see that on your screen. Okay. And if we don't, we'll move along. Um, no, I think she muted herself again, so maybe maybe not. Okay. Uh, and if you want me to unmute you, just uh, send us a uh, message in the chat and I'll send you that request after our next question. Okay. I was thrilled to hear you plug the library so many times. Library programs, story times, and reading, they're also important for children. And they're important for parents and children to come together and talk about literacy and learn about literacy and absorb literacy. Um, one of our library staff actually is listening in, Suzanne, um, and this is what she says, at the library, we train staff to recommend that parents always read to their child in their first language. This is so that reading together, reading time remains a positive experience for both parent and child. If the adult is frustrated with words, the child will pick up on this. So parents, please remember that you are your child's first and best teacher. And Suzanne was actually answering a question that Carla had about exposure to other languages. Um, Carla asks, are there other stimuli that help with language acquisition, like adding in music, lullabies and lap rhymes, or introducing sign language to an infant? Um, yeah, so music is great. Uh, music really rhymes music that that really emphasizes the rhythm and and the the um, yeah, that's that's a great way to enhance language learning sign is uh, it's it's a different thing altogether. So, um, when you're talking about sign, I think sign language, um, I, I think of 
sign language as as a language, but you might be thinking of just learning sort of a few symbols to communicate with children before they could speak. I'm not sure which version you mean. Um, I I can see how that could be useful for for communicating, but I think music is what I would really emphasize: music and and rhymes. Lots and lots of rhythm. Yeah. Yeah. We have a question about French immersion. So Rena has her daughter in grade one French immersion, and her concern is that this will delay her English language acquisition, primarily when reading. So all her reading, her learning content is in French. French is not her native language. And she wants to know if you have any suggestions to support them. I feel you. I feel you because I'm in the same situation. You know, I, I have two kids um, roughly in the same age range um, in French immersion. And I'm not sure if, if you English is the language that you speak at home. Um, so if English is the language that you're speaking at home, um, then it, can I have clarification? Is that is that the case? Yes, Elizabeth, we speak English at home. And my yeah. parents, they speak Punjabi, so my children understand Punjabi, but they can't speak it. And we yeah. only speak English. And my daughter is now learning French at school, and all of her learning contents in French. So I'm supporting her through this through Google Translate. Um, but at some point, I do the same. Right? <laughs> I do the so same. That's the only way I'll be able to help her. And I'm learning French through the process, but I want to make sure that she still has a good grasp on learning how to read and write in English. Yeah, I mean, I, I was really worried about this. Um, so I, I have a French immersion third grader. Um, I just hear I'm speaking from personal experience instead of science here. I mean, I think that um, I had the same concerns and then my child did pick up English. It was a little later. So I, I spoke to a lot of people about this, a lot of teachers and, and educators. And when you do have a child in French immersion, um, depending on how much you are working on reading at home, reading can come a little bit later in English, um, obviously because they're getting French in school all day. Um, so I think it can be slower and that's okay. Um, but they are learning French, which, which is quite a benefit. So you, you, you sort of have to, you have to weigh the cost and, and, um, the, the, the delay in, in learning to read in English, but learning to read in French, for example, will help them learn to read in English or vice versa. Um, those skills do translate a little bit. Uh, so it's nice to keep that in mind. Um, and also remember that French immersion, I mean, it's, it's built for kids who don't have French speaking parents at home. So they know, I think they know that those kids aren't, aren't getting that French support at home. Um, that said, I, I do see the, the, the issue and, and, um, there are different solutions. So if your child is in French immersion in Mississauga in Peel region, for example, I think it's half day French immersion, half day English, whereas in Toronto, it's now full day French and it starts when kids are in JK. So it's, it's a lot more French. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I think it's, it's a valid, um, concern and it's one that a lot of, um, parents have, but I do think the kids do pick up the the reading skill in the other language and you have to encourage it right um yeah great sorry that's not no, no. completely that's so. not a completely satisfactory it's not a completely satisfactory answer because i think it is it is something you have to think about and it is something you have to support yeah. you do have to support great. the Thank reading you so in, much. In i English. do appreciate your insight and sienna is in full day but elizabeth i will certainly pick your brain following today's talk <laughs> yeah for sure great thank you and it's clear from a lot of the feedback on the chat line that parents worry, caring parents worry, no matter what they're doing. They always want to get it right. They worry about this. I understand. I'm a parent too. I worry, worry, worry. It's, it's okay. Um, but I think the important thing to remember is kids are resilient, especially when it comes to language. They are so good. Um, kids are resilient. They, they will learn to read in English and French, and it's great if they can also understand another language, as is the case with the, the, the parent we just spoke with. So um, be patient. Um, every kid has a different, they all are in a different situation. Don't compare your kid to another kid. Don't just, just be patient. And, um, you know, if, if you're really worried, talk to, talk to an expert, but but children do learn, they can learn. And if they are a little bit slower on learning to read in English, for example, or if they're a little bit slower to read, speak their first word as, as a baby because they're learning more than one language, it's it's okay. Um, the benefits are are great and they have they're learning a lot more. 
It's okay. Yeah. Here's another thing that parents worry about. Diana wonders, is it possible for children to learn a language when they're not immersed in it at home? For example, through weekend classes. Um, are you talking about French immersion? Because that sounds like French immersion to me. I, or, I, or immersion think, into another. I think they're thinking more of weekend classes like Mandarin on Saturday afternoon at, at so can you learn can you learn Mandarin through Mandarin classes on Saturday afternoon alone? Um, I think that you uh, there's individual variation. I think that kids learn a language when they have a good reason to learn a language. They need to communicate in that language. So some of the programs are really good because um, they are motivated to communicate in Mandarin um, through those programs. Uh, some of the some of the drawbacks are that if you're only getting exposure in a classroom setting, though, if it's more book learning, then I think that the learning won't be as as good as the immersion setting or the, you know, we're going to do an activity together um, setting. Um, I think full 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 fluency is is difficult to get from from a single classroom. But that said. Just establishing, for example, a young child being exposed to Mandarin on the weekends is getting exposed to the sounds of Mandarin, and they're laying down um, information that will allow them to eventually, if they desire to become fully fluent and use that as a dominant language in, in any stage of their life, they will be able to do that better if they were exposed early on. So um, even if you're not seeing a child become fully fluent in a language, um, they're likely learning something that will be um, important and it's good to get that exposure early on. But I do agree it's quite difficult to really learn a language from a weekend class. Um, that's more of a support, I think, um, and a way for children to meet other children who are learning that same language and have motivation to speak the language. Yeah, yeah thank you. And it's so nice to hear the libraries keep popping up. They're so important. There's another testimonial, and I just want to read. I'm so happy that my daughter was one of your junior scientists. That comes from Rima. <laughs> <laughs> and That's I think, awesome. I think we have one last question here at the end. Um, my six-year-old daughter mispronounces a lot of words, and I was told she might be dyslexic. I don't see it when she's reading, and her teacher is not concerned at all. Just wondering if it would be the effect of bilingual parents and English is not our native language. Yeah, I think that you need to be speaking to an expert um, in bilingual uh, who can do assessments for bilingual children. Um, this is this is something that we have a real need for, and and we're improving uh, the speech um, language assessments. But you do need to take into account the fact that there might be another language um, in in the mix. And um, yeah, if you're worried with a six year old um, not pronouncing words uh, the way that you would expect. It's certainly worth looking into, but um, yeah, look, get talk to talk to a professional, but make sure that they are experienced in in assessing bilingual kids. Okay, we're, we're coming to the end of our time here. The one last thing I want to say is you have the cutest pictures in your presentation. <laughs> <laughs> I'm yeah. sure everyone was ooing and eyeing over them. Um, Great. Well, I I. I feel like I, I I can cheat to keep you all engaged because I can show cute babies. That's something that people who work in other areas can't do. So <laughs> I'm lucky. Yeah, but we're all naturally drawn to them and that's, it's the human condition. Right. It's such a tie. Um, this brings us to the end of our program tonight. So thank you so much, Professor Johnson. That was fabulous. Um, this is also our last lecture me program for the 2022-2023 academic season. We hope that everybody has either learned and been an entertained this season. Um, there's been such a wide gamut of subjects. Please join us for upcoming presentations coming this fall. Um, if you have comments, please leave them for us. Good night, everybody. Thank you, everyone.